Hi, I'm Mike, owner of the Ingroove in Phoenix, Arizona. Today I'm gonna to do another video showing you guys some of the stuff I am bringing home for my personal collection this week. Haven't been making too many videos lately. It's Christmas time. Uh, things have been going on at the store and personally, but uh, I decided to do a video here this fine Monday and show you guys some of the stuff I am bringing home to my collection. And this is a video full of killer. <laughs> oh, so many grails in here for people, uh, records that have been grails for me, and then also records that I didn't know really even existed that I just happened upon. Uh, and I'll share with you uh, some of the stuff. I want to start by showing you guys a record that I had wanted 20 years, and that is Link Ray's first album, Link Ray and the Ray Man. This is a record that I've had in my collection, but I had a G plus copy. I'm actually going to put that in the store and sell it. But it's been an impossible record to find clean. It's just this era of records with this type of music. It's just extremely difficult to find. And also, I don't think this sold very well. You got to think how difficult it is to find like a clean 50s Elvis record. Imagine if that was, you know, hundreds of times rarer. And the fact that it didn't sell as well, and that is this. But this Link Ray is every bit of a near mint record. It's actually stamped promo, not for sale. It came with a stamped back as demonstration, not for sale. And then it also came with uh, this absolutely not original. Sunshine Sound Sleeve. <laughs> Don't know why I even have that in there. We'll take that out. But uh, this actually was part of the promo collection, that $100,000 collection I showed you guys some time back, maybe a year ago. I'm actually finally getting around to getting some of those boxes cleaned. That collection is at the store. It was actually being stored elsewhere. It is now back at the store and being gone through. And it has been one hell of a fun week doing so because some of the stuff that's in that collection is just unbelievable some of the stuff i knew was there i just hadn't got to it some of the stuff i'm just finding out like i didn't even realize that was there and that brings me to this next record this is short messages from daryl dragon daryl dragon right daryl dragon is the captain from the captain and Neil. His brother, Dennis Dragon, went on to form the Surf Punks. I didn't know this record existed. Oddly enough, when Daryl or Dennis passed, there was an auction here in Phoenix with some of their assets. I bought a bunch of master tapes. I actually might have the master tape for this. I'm not sure. It's being stored off site. I've got a lot of surf punk master tapes, but I don't have a lot. I don't know the other stuff. But anyways, I bought a bunch of surf punk records, some 45s in the master tapes from that auction. It was a local auction here, and I wasn't even aware of this record. I looked this thing up because I saw it. And I'm like, oh, Daryl Dragon. But you know, you think to yourself, how exciting could a record from the captain be? <laughs> So you don't think much, but I'm like, boy, this, this really doesn't look like your typical Captain and Tennille fair, right? I mean, look at this cover. This looks, you know, this is the inners. You know, so you're thinking here, so, hmm. Okay, I didn't even notice this. There's an original letter in here from 1972. It's actually addressed to Haywire Records. Dear Jan, thank you for your prompt reply to my letter. I must explain that Mr. Dragon's albums, album was originally going to be on the ESP label. After printing up the jackets, an album cover he decided to keep it on haywire i hope you enjoy listening to this album thanks mary 
So I don't know what's going on there, but I actually noticed on this sleeve here, they scratched out ESP and then put Haywire in blue. Anyways, let's talk about this record. So I go on Discogs and like five people, six people have it. I became the seventh. Hundreds of people want it, but there's no sales history. I go on Pop Psych, there's no sales history. I look and I find a listing from a record store out in California, maybe it was Rockaway, years ago, to where VG copies sold for 3,500 bucks. I, I was like, wow, I got a minty copy. It must be five grand or more. Let me listen to it. And so I listened to it. It's Daryl Dragon on side one right, from The Captain and Tennille. It's Dennis Dragon on side two from The Surf Punks. Side two, I'm not a big fan of. It's very ambient, drone type of music. It's like 30 minutes long. The sound quality is mediocre. But side one, The Captain's side, is actually fantastic. There's a lot of clavicle playing on it and like synthesizer type stuff. That's just killer. It's a killer psych record. The Side one is a killer psych record. Side two, ambient. But <laughs> in the terms of private press, psychedelic records, I could really see how this could fetch that kind of money. So rare it's never been sold publicly on Discogs or Pop Psych. Uh, so it's got the rarity thing down pat. It's actually got the tie-in from the Captain and Tennille on the Surf Punks. And it's actually, Side One's really good. You can go on YouTube and you can hear it. But that was like a really pleasant surprise, a record I knew absolutely nothing about. But yeah. Okay, so these next two records are not heavy hitters, but they're fantastic. I've been looking for a nice 12-inch, decent-sounding copy of Sid Vicious doing my way. I loved this since the early 90s when I heard Sid Vicious singing my way, closing out Goodfellas, the movie. Martin Scorsese has the absolute best soundtracks ever. But uh, it's a song I've always loved. It was actually played at my father's funeral. It was the Elvis version, though, because my father was a big Elvis fan. Uh, it, I don't know, it's just a song that I listen to. Every time it comes on, I can't turn it off. It's been covered many times. I've always dug Elvis's version, probably myself. The, you know, that's probably the version I dig the most. I love Frank's version, you know, he's the guy who made it the big song that it is. But I love hearing other interpretations of My Way. This uh, Sid Vicious was actually in that promo collection. And yeah, this is, what is this? This is like a 12 inch, it's a comp of all Sid Vicious stuff and it's like a French only comp. But uh, yeah, two pound 93 pence back in who knows, but uh, yeah. So I got a 12 inch of that. Then I'm digging through the collection as well. And this is something I've never heard. And this is Nina Hagen. I'm familiar with, you know, I've got some Nina Hagen records. I actually really like Nina Hagen. I've never heard her do my way. I encourage you guys to listen to this. This is really good. You guys might listen to this and think to yourself, what the hell is Mike talking about? That was awful. I thought this was fantastic. Her vocals, this is a Holland pressing 12 inch. I've actually got a seven of the inch of this, I noticed on Discogs, but uh, I'm not a big seven inch fan. They don't fit as nicely in my shelf. But uh, yeah, this is fantastic. I encourage you to listen to that. Maybe that Dennis Dragon 12 inch. Okay, I've showed on live streams many, many times. When I get clean copies of this, when I get any copies of this album, originals, I do not sell them. To me, I think this is wildly underpriced. You see, in the world of vinyl, you see the worst, crappiest music that has a possible Banksy cover go for $10,000 now. Uh, some Blur singles that have Banksy art go for way, way, way more than they would if they weren't. You know what I mean? If it's uh would normally be a $10, $20 single, it's a five, $600 single, right? This to me, is more iconic 
musically more significant. You know, it's one of those records that is on the top 10 lists most of the time of greatest albums of all time. Uh, it's never been a mainstream record, but the people that know, like, no, it's a great record. So I always have thought these are undervalued. They should be much more valuable than they are. Now, that's changing a lot lately. I'm starting to see copies of this, even beat-up copies. Originals go for 500 to a grand now, and I'm seeing really clean copies, seal copies, go upwards to 10 grand. But this beautiful West Coast pressing, now this is the airbrushed cover, so not the super, you know, this is a third pressing. It had the torso on the back photo, then it had the sticker over the torso, and then it had the airbrush cover. But first pressing vinyl with a beautifully intact banana peel. And of course I had to keep it. If it wasn't beautiful, I'd still keep it. I've got about this many of them at this point, but I always add those to the collection, and I'm always excited to get it, but the vinyl on that is cherry. But this is something that I don't have. Well, I have the record, but I don't have it in this condition. I have never seen a copy of White Heat, or excuse me, White Light, White Heat, without ring wear. I mean, this is like the most cherry cover I've ever seen. Super crisp corners, no ring wear. This cover, and this is the first pressing with the uh, that that tattoo skull. I don't know if it's visible on the camera here, you know, but this is a first pressing, deep groove without ring wear. So I was just blown away to get this. It's such a hard record to get clean. That cover just got decimated. Same thing with that velvet. To find the uh, Nico with that white of a cover is actually really, really difficult. They are always discolored and whipped. So two records that I have, but I don't have that clean. This next one is kind of going to make a lot of people laugh. I love the Bee Gees. I love every era of the Bee Gees. I love disco Bee Gees, Spicks and Specks Bee Gees, the ballad Bee Gees in the early 70s, you know, Massachusetts, that kind of thing, uh, Lonely Nights. But a lot of those early records, and including this one, are actually really difficult to find clean. I've never been able to add Odessa to my collection because the covers are always disintegrating and I don't want to put disintegrating trashed felt covers on you know I don't want to contaminate my other records I don't want that felt breezing through my record collection I have never seen a copy even remotely this clean the vinyl itself is unplayed but the cover you touch the felt and it actually isn't disintegrating in your hand it's no ring wear I mean it's just an amazing condition and I went online and I looked and it's like, you see people claiming to have clean copies of this and they don't go for a ton. But A, I would, if I didn't care for the Bee Gees, I would never sell this record for what it's claimed to be worth because I've never, and, and I've seen dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe a hundred plus copies of this. I've never seen one even remotely this clean, but I was super stoked to get this. There was a bunch of other early 70s promo Bee Gees stuff as well. Another really, not as high dollar as uh, the Daryl Dennis Dragon record, but Yesterday's Children. This is a promo on Map City. Psych Grail for many people. Goes for, you know, a few hundred bucks. It's not crazy. This is a real nice uh, promo copy. Let's see. You can see it has the promo sticker on the back. Not for sale. It's got something written on it. Wanted to hide that. <laughs> but uh, unplayed, you know, like I said, that collection, I wish at the time, if I wasn't so busy, I would have liked to include more of what was in that collection. Because that collection was close to 100 boxes, and I kind of breezed through maybe six of them when I originally made that video. But that collection was just absolutely fantastic. Here is another more than likely grail for a lot of people. The last version, copy of this sold for 2,500 bucks on Discogs. It sold maybe five or six times on Pop Psych, anywhere up to two grand. This is Pete Fine. Pete Fine was in a band called, I think it was, what was it, The Flow? They, it was a psych band. They had enough material to do a single-sided album. I think it was like The Flow's greatest hit. It was a single-sided disc. I think, Recently, Pete has actually done some interviews discussing the early flow work and actually this. 
This is I'm trying to read the name of the record. It's super private press, stamp labels and everything. It is Pete Fine on a day of crystalline thought. Apparently, Pete was from New York. He did the flow in New York. He moved to Tucson uh, and did a day of crystalline thought. All words and music by Pete Fine, 1974. But you can see it's kind of generic jacket. Glued some photography onto it. So super basic. It includes some lyrics. But you can tell too, the disc is super homemade, you know, rubber stamp info on the label. Uh, it's, I didn't dig it as much as the Daryl Dragon record, but it is really kind of interesting. It's got almost like a moody blues vibe, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the moody blues kind of started a thing, you know. A uh, little flute playing, uh, a lot of killer guitar on this, but it's more in like the classical folky vein. So it turns out Pete Fine today is actually a classical guitarist and has been for years, and I guess he still performs in Tucson. He's got a website going to where he's doing more classical-oriented stuff in Tucson. But yeah, this is... Uh, his private press record from 1974. Well, like I said, the last copy, 2,500 bucks on Discogs. Okay, I got a lot of great jazz records. I should have probably said that at the upfront, but uh, a lot of great jazz records still going through that jazz collection. And I'm finding a lot of great jazz records still to this day in it. These are mid 60s, like 62 to 68 pressings. I've got a bunch of these John Coltrane's, but they're all just like stone mint. Here's a copy of my favorite things. This is a mid to late 60s copy, mono, but I love these because they're not worth a ton of money. They come in these beautiful, thick, laminated jackets, and the copies that this guy had in his collection were all still, you know, near mint. Really, really clean, great play copies. Uh, I like to keep them because a lot of, and if I get an original that is quiet and looks like this, I'll get rid of these, these later pressings. But most of the time, the earlier the Atlantic stuff is going to the early sixties, late fifties, it's on noisy vinyl. I think the vinyl improved by the sixties. So a lot of times these tend to be better play copies. But I got a stereo copy around the same era of Giant Steps. Laminated cover still, you know, they eventually phased that out. And then I got a Coltrane Jazz around the same era. Still laminate cover, stereo cover to where they put the, uh, you know, the painted on, almost like silk screened stereo on there. I'm a huge Talking Heads fan. I collect all their stuff. So when I got the seven inch singles collection, there was only a few bands that I actually kept the seven inches from because I'm a big fan. Talking Heads were one of them. I've got pretty much everything that the Talking Heads ever done. I've never been able to actually add this to my collection. This is the uh, Speaking in Tongues picture-ish. I guess it was a picture disc, you know, but you can see this is sealed. Original hype sticker on it. This plastic is always destroyed. Uh, the discs are always warped. And in Phoenix, we've got the most optimal conditions you're going to ever find to store records. Almost no, very, very low humidity. Obviously not outside, but everybody's got air conditioning. It's had really good air conditioning for decades. So this has been stored in a beautiful, and I know where this was stored, shaded, perfect temperature area, and this is how it still looks. Now, granted, it's not disintegrated, so I've never wanted to keep one of these trashed speaking in tongues in my collection with, you know, cracked, 
a crack case and a warp disk, and it sounds like crap anyways. Uh, but when I found this sealed copy, I'm like, you know what? We're gonna keep this because this is the best it's ever going to get. It's sealed, but it's in one piece, although you can tell the disk inside is warped, and uh, it's all faded brown. I'm guessing this was clear back in the day. But it'll sit on the shelf. This is something you don't ever see, and they're probably not worth a ton. Maybe they are, but everybody knows that's watching this channel. But if you don't know, I'm a huge Elvis fan, my favorite artist of all time, something you do not see very often because why would you, is Elvis promos. Like, why would you have to promo Elvis Presley? Why would RCA have to spend the money to send out promos by the 70s of Elvis? It's Elvis. You know what you're getting. Everybody knew who Elvis was when this came out. But they did, I guess, still make, but you don't see them. I'm like, I've never seen them. They still made like banded for, I guess, on these concert albums. They banded some of them. Actually, I know I got two here. I got uh, Graceland and I got Live in Madison Square Garden. But uh, I think it says banded uh, for radio. This album has been banded for DJ use. So there have been gaps in between the songs so a DJ could start or cut off certain tracks. I don't think Madison Square Garden was banded, but I was so stoked when I saw these, knowing they're not worth much, but never knowing they really ever existed because I've never seen them. Knowing how much I love, you know, I love Elvis, but to see these like stone mint DJ copies and my, the best Elvis for me is live Elvis from the 70s. I just absolutely love, it has always been my favorite Elvis, you know, Vegas Elvis, Aloha from Hawaii Elvis, 68 Comeback Special Elvis. I loved Elvis live in the 70s. That's the favorite. Most people are like, no, no, that's the schmaltz, 50s rock and roll Elvis. But for me, that was like peak Elvis. A lot of jazz grails still to show you guys. Some upgrades. I've been taking a lot of these things, so if you're local, you'll notice there's a lot of killer jazz records coming in. I've actually put them on the wall. I've got a little a jazz wall going because I found such great jazz records in this collection. But look at this beautiful Horace Silver. This is... Uh, just came out as a Blue Note Classic. Uh, six pieces of silver. But look at this beautiful Lexington Avenue pressing really clean. I had about three copies of this record, different eras and different conditions. And when I got this in, you know, beautiful flat edge. I'm like, all right, well, we can just get rid of all the other ones. Cause I got the, I got the one now. Beautiful. Oh man, look at that. Oh, I just want to play this right now. <laughs> it's pretty much not a mark on it. Oh, there's some spindle wear on this with some spindle marks, but the disc itself is really, really clean. The jacket is really clean. You know, early Lexingtons, they weren't heavy laminate. They were a matte finish. This is a uh, actually a second cover. But uh, disc-wise, it's a first disc. You know, it's got everything, you know, flat edge, uh, double deep groove, Lexington Avenue label, all the markings. But uh, yeah, six pieces of silver. Some more early jazz records, not a really expensive record. You know, no Jimmy Smith is, but here's another Lexington Avenue. Uh, this is a little bit later of a Lexington Avenue because it doesn't, you know, it's got a rimmed edge. But yeah, nice, clean Jimmy Smith. Not one you see too much. You don't see any Lexington Avenues too much, you know, if I'm being honest. Okay, here is a record that I had in my collection, but not this cherry. Look at this. Ooh, just excited holding it. Let's take it out of there. I got to take it out of there. There's beautiful musings of Miles. Look at that cover. Almost looks like a new pressing. It's so nice. But you can look on the back here and be like, okay, yeah. Look how beautiful that is. Got the original. I'm guessing this was the original. This was what came on it. Little inner bag. Some of them were wax paper. Some of this were inner bags. But some of the records in this collection. But I folded them up and I put it inside. 
but it's a 50th Street first typeset, true first prestige label. Very exciting to get that. So the other one will go to the store. Here's a record I didn't have an original of, but I do now. Fantastic record. Jackie McLean Quartet, four, five, and six. Beautiful first pressing 50th Street address. This is actually a, and this collection had a chunk of them. This is a drilled record. So this was like an early cutout. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a drill mark right here. And if you look at the vinyl itself, they just drilled through the whole thing. Uh, I got this on eBay, and I think I got it for a reasonable price for considering it's a near mint copy of four, five, and six because of that drill mark. I think that maybe discouraged some people. I don't know the reason, but I don't mind that because it was period specific. You know what I mean? Some sort of damage happened after the fact. That would kind of be a problem for me, but that's not the case here. But uh, yeah, this is really a whole video of nothing but older pressings. I have some new stuff to show you guys, but I'm gonna have to do a lot more of that on the following uh, video because I left it all at the store. <laughs> so I just grabbed some stuff I had at the house. All right, guys, theingroove.com. Until next time.